Hey guys, Dr. Tyler Shelton here, and today I wanted to go over pain, a little bit about what it is, what it isn't, and why it matters for your rehab with us here at Shelton Movement and Performance. This is quite honestly one of the most important things that you can understand when going through rehab here, so I think it's really important to just get the jump on it and have you have a really good understanding of it right from the start. All right, so please carve out a little bit of time with me here, and uh, we'll go over exactly what you can expect from us and kind of how we associate pain with the body and how we'll put that into your plan of care. All righty? So the biggest question that I always hear is, why do I care? You know, a lot of people are coming to me and they're saying, I I just, you know, just get me better. I don't really care why. I'd just rather you just get me better. And that's all well and good, and I'm certainly not going to throw a bunch of technical mumbo-jumbo at you the entire time you're in here. But this, once again, is a really important concept to understand. Matter of fact, studies are showing that just by understanding pain, people have been able to feel less and less pain from a prior injury or whatever is causing you pain at this time. I myself, when I was going through physical therapy school, um, I had an injury that I was having a lot of trouble with and actually once I did my own research and learned all the stuff that I'm about to share with you about pain I was able to take myself out of a little bit more pain than I was in at the start so you know it's not necessarily going to resolve your issue but it can help you see pain in a whole new light and it will really really help you associate different movements different activities and just your entire rehab experience will be different if you understand pain in the way that I'm about to explain it to you so the biggest thing that I want you guys to take away from this is that I'm not trying to sit you down and give you a lecture. I more want to impress upon you how important it is to understand your pain, again, what it is, what it isn't, and what it means for you specifically. So first and foremost, pain is a survival mechanism, right? Pain, pain is a good thing. Matter of fact, there are diseases that people can have where you don't feel pain and that can be a real problem because children that grow up with this disease don't realize that when they touch a really hot plate that's going to be bad for their body their skin's still going to burn their their skin which is a, the biggest organ in your body is going to get damaged but they don't realize that they're doing that to themselves so that's just one example of how pain allows you to survive now survival means something a little bit different today than it used to mean it used to mean like hey here comes a woolly mammoth, I should probably get out of its way or else I'm going to feel a lot of pain here. Or, you know, something just bit me, I'm going to have to get out of the way or get as far away from that source as possible. Today, pain presents itself a lot differently because our daily tasks are a lot different. Maybe you're sitting in a cubicle all day or maybe you are turning a wrench all day and you're, you're out there working on your feet all day. It, it doesn't really matter what you're doing. Pain is always going to be telling you something that either you shouldn't be doing or something's up. It's the check engine light of your body. And, you know, imagine if you were driving your car and there's an engine problem, but your check engine light didn't come on. You'd be stranded in the middle of the road with no solution whatsoever and be making a lot of phone calls to OnStar. So it's really important to understand that pain is essential for your body. It's not always fun. And by it's a good thing, I don't necessarily mean it's a good thing that you have pain. Obviously, that's not something that you want to experience all the time, but it is a good thing that that system is working. Now, the big problem is when pain lasts longer than it's expected to. That is usually an indicator that the brain and nervous system are involved, and we're going to go into that a little bit later. But pain is usually supposed to resolve around 12 weeks from an injury. Tissue injuries usually resolve in about 12 weeks, give or take, depending on the severity. So understanding that when pain is lasting, what we call chronic pain, that's your body, your brain, and your nervous system being highly sensitized to something and not necessarily equivalent to a tissue injury. Another really important point to understand is that pain can't be seen. So it leads to a lot of misdiagnosis and guesswork when it comes to telling you why you're in pain. And if you think about it, a lot of the medical system is structured around getting you out of pain. And there are all types of ways that people have found to try to diagnose pain. And one of the biggest ones that's used nowadays is imaging. Specifically, x-rays and MRIs are used a lot to tell people why they're in pain. But research is consistently showing that imaging is really, really good for ruling out the big stuff, the heavy hitters, like a tumor, like a break in the bone, like a tear in the muscle, a large tear in the muscle, a cyst, something like that. But what it's not so good at is diagnosing the reason you're in pain. 
So a lot of people walk into my office telling me that an x-ray or an MRI found bulging discs or that they had degenerative disc disease or bursitis or stenosis or any other thing that you can think of that's simply a misalignment or something that shouldn't show up in a perfect x-ray or a perfect MRI. But when you look at the statistics on how well that represents people that are in pain, plenty of studies are now showing that if you were to line up people of different ages in a room and all of them had no pain whatsoever, at least 50%, if not more in some age groups, are going to have one of these differences showing up on their scans. So it's really not a reliable source for telling you why you're in pain, but unfortunately, a lot of people are following these really long rabbit holes of medications, injections, and surgery, trying to get rid of these issues that are coming up on the images. Another important point to note is that pain stems from the brain. All of our pain experience comes from the brain, including the immediate physical pain that we may be in or past emotional pains, and everything plays together. So stress is involved, the amount of sleep we get, what we're eating, everything that feeds signals into the brain in some way, shape, or form affects the pain that we're in now. So if I'm telling you that the pain is in your head, it's because I'm saying the pain is literally in your head. It's coming from your brain. But also what that means is that pain can be controlled by the emotional state that we're in, by the mental state that we're in. And that's not to say that you can just eliminate all the stress in your life and problem solved, but it is to say that there are a lot of variables that go into pain other than the cut and dry, hey, I stepped on a nail, therefore I'm in pain. A lot more goes into that, and we'll certainly delve into that as we go along here. So above all things, pain is a protective mechanism. It's going to guide our actions because we are more likely to move away from pain than towards pleasure. And that's emotional pain, that's physical pain, that's any kind of pain that the human body has experienced in the past. We're going to move away from that. And if you see somebody that, you know, steps on a seashell while walking on the beach and they go down like somebody just shot them in the foot, you know, you could be looking at them thinking that's not really that big a deal. Suck it up. You're fine. But what you might not know is that that person stepped on a seashell three years ago and ended up in the hospital for three weeks with an infection. So there's a lot that plays into it. And people are going to react differently because of their past experience, their emotional pain and the physical aspects of the pain. So. The other thing that it's going to protect against is overworking. And this is why most of you are coming to see me is because a muscle in some case scenario has been overworked, whether it's you've been sitting for too long in a position and your body is just statically, the muscles have been working way too hard in a single position for a long time. It could be re repetitive stress and movement. I know a lot of people know that, you know, baseball pitchers end up having a lot of elbow and even shoulder problems into their careers because they're just doing the same exact motion over and over again at a high velocity. Well, it's not just them. It's anybody that's doing any kind of repetitive motion, even something as simple as moving your mouse around, can eventually cause your body to protect against that overworking. And then the obvious one, I think, for everybody is moving something that's a little bit too heavy. I think at one point or another, everybody that's listening to this has tried to pick something up that they thought was a little bit lighter than it actually was, and they felt their back or wherever just kind of pull a little bit and give out. And that's that's not your body quitting on you. That's your body saying, hey, no, I don't want you to do this. I'm going to tighten up and protect. And that's what your muscles do. They, they, don't, they don't just go away. They just don't, don't just quit on you in most case scenarios. They just tighten up and they say, we're, we're going to stay here and protect this joint or protect this area from any further harm. It's also incredibly important to understand that our beliefs about pain can play into our current pain experience. Questions like, why am I in pain? Am I in control? What's the diagnosis? Is there a solution? Are constantly running through our minds while we're in pain. But nowadays, we are hardwired to rely heavily on the diagnosis. And not only that, we're able to do what no other generation has done before us, and that once we're given a diagnosis, we go immediately to Dr. Google and get our minds completely scared by all the stuff that we find on the internet about what happens to people with that diagnosis. And I wanna help you understand that sometimes a diagnosis is nothing more than 
a code that's put into a computer that's billed to insurance. When in, so people are going and getting these diagnoses and one, they may not even re realize that that's not really the reason that you're in pain. It's just something that got picked up on an image. And two, they're going and finding out all these terrible things to happen to other people that were given that diagnosis. All right, so when I have people in front of me and I'm telling them, hey, your diagnosis may actually not be the reason you're in pain, you see the relief come over some people's faces where they're like, oh my gosh, thank goodness, because that's that sounded terrible online. And on the flip side of that, some people really need that diagnosis and they're comforted by knowing that this is something it's been seen before and there's a solution for it. The reality of the situation is that everybody has a very specific reason that they're in pain and a lot more than just a diagnosis code plays into that. So understanding more of the reason that you're in pain, what led you to this pain and what can be done about it is a lot more important than a specific diagnosis that has led certain people down one path and other people down another path. Understanding that there is a solution to it is, is tough when you're being told from several different outlets that this pretty much leads in one direction and that direction are pain medications, injections, and surgery. One of the things that people get really hung up on is the type of pain they're in especially when it comes to nerve pain. When people, when you visualize a nerve being compressed and signals to other areas in your body being cut off, that's something else that can really add into the stress levels that are involved in this pain. And a lot of people don't realize that just because the pain is radiating or referring to a different spot, that doesn't mean that there's a nerve being pressed on. Muscles have well-documented referral patterns and could just as easily be the case. A really good example of this is I've seen a lot of people who have been given the diagnosis of sciatica, which is the nerve that runs down the back of your leg. And what a lot of people don't realize is that muscles on the side of your hip also have a very similar referral pattern to pain going down the back of your leg. So it's not always as worrisome or as serious as it seems. Nerve pain has very specific presentation but all too often people are associating any kind of pain that goes anywhere other than a localized spot as nerve pain. And that once again can really exacerbate your own symptoms just by assuming that you've got a nerve that's being pushed on. Inception is another factor that plays a huge role in people's pain experience. Most everybody is gonna to be told by somebody else they know if they've been in pain for long enough how that person's pain experience went, whether or not it's a surgery that somebody's had, or maybe they've had back pain for forever and their doctor told them that it was a disc bulge and they needed to take certain number of medications and get injections and ultimately there's a disc replacement surgery that you can get. And this is really going to stress you out if you're just listening to everybody else's pain experience because it's not your own. It could be similar to yours, you could have the exact same symptoms, but your pain could be coming from a completely different cause. So hearing what others are telling you about their pain experience isn't always the best thing for you. And then on top of that, a lot of terms that are getting used in the medical world nowadays are really, really dangerous for your mental health and your, and your pain experience as well because people are being told things like you blew your knee out or you have the worst spine I've ever seen or you have the knees of an 80-year-old or you're, you're, t you're all twisted up. And these are things that I've actually heard patients tell me. And regardless of what an image shows, it's not something that we should be telling people because it's going to frame your mind in the worst possible case scenario. It's going to, every time you think of your back, you're gonna just think of a bunch of twisted up bones and a bunch of twisted up muscle that can't be relieved. And that can, that can once again, stress you out and very much make things worse on a real level because as your stress goes up so does your pain your nervous system is going to get fried so it's important to realize when you when you hear other people telling you about their experience is that you are not the same as them regardless of how similar your symptoms sound regardless of how similar the injury mechanism was your issue is not somebody else's issue so don't worry about what other people are telling you about what happened to them. Worry about what's going on with you and the best way to fix that. 
So everything we've discussed so far with past experiences, beliefs about pain, inception from other people telling you about their experience with pain, all plays into your stress levels. And stress levels affect the central nervous system and the brain to a degree where if as your stress rises, so does your pain. And that's been, that's not just me saying that, that's, that's scientifically proven that stress levels can exacerbate pain. So it's not realistic to say, hey, go get rid of all your stress and, that, and therefore your pain will go away. But what it is saying is that the amount of pain you're in can be drastically managed by managing your stress levels and being able to manage what you can while you're going through a painful experience. So that's getting enough sleep. That's whether or not there are things you can do about the stress, stress levels of work. Um, polling indicates that marriage, kids, friends, and work are always in the top tier of why people are stressed. So what I would like you to do over the next couple of days is think about when you're in the most pain and what situations are occurring around that. You know, maybe you just fought with a teenage, your teenager at home. Maybe your work is getting really overbearing. Maybe you're not getting enough sleep. Maybe your friend just told you that their other friend had surgery because of the same type of back pain that you're having right now. Maybe there's something that you can control in your day-to-day -day that will help a lot with your pain levels. So one really important misconception to understand when you're thinking about pain is that pain doesn't always correlate to tissue damage. And I think it's an assumption just given how much we rely on imaging to tell us whether or not we're in pain, that tissue damage means that there should be pain involved. A good example of this that I use a lot is whenever you step on a little child's plastic toy, which I'm sure everybody here has done at one time or another. And that hurts almost to the point where it takes you down. I even joke with people all the time that scale is zero to 10, zero being no pain, 10 is stepping on a Lego. Obviously it's a little bit tongue in cheek, but it gets the point across that that freaking hurts. and you know, if you if you step on a Lego and then look at the bottom of your foot, you could have not even the smallest mark, but your brain is telling you don't ever do that again. That hurts so bad. Another easy one to understand is a paper cut. Everybody's had a paper cut one time or another, and just the tiniest little cut can cause an incredible amount of pain. Now, obviously, these are not long lasting issues, but it gets the point across that just because there is tissue damage in the body that shows up on an x-ray or an MRI does not necessarily mean that there's going to be pain involved. If it did, the amount of pain that you would get from a paper cut or stepping on a Lego would be nowhere near as much as it is. In a typical case, tissue damage heals in around 12 weeks, and it would stand to reason that if pain and tissue damage were the same, that the pain should resolve at the same time as the tissue damage. But we all know that's not always the case. Sometimes the pain resolves first, sometimes the tissue damage resolves first. If you're lucky, they resolve at the same time. But more often than not, pain sticks around even after the tissue damage is, is healed. So then why are we allowing x-rays and MRIs to dictate why we're in pain? The most important thing for you to understand here is that just because you have a scary image, that's not necessarily why you're in pain. And that's an important point to understand because when people see that they have a tear or that there's, there's a break or there's you know a malalignment in their spine, they assume that, oh, this is a lot more serious. And once again, it ramps up the stress levels. It ramps up the, will I ever get better? What's my diagnosis? Am I in control of this situation? Or do I just have to accept a certain amount of pain for the rest of my life? way too many people are told, yeah, it's just some degenerative changes or it's it's this or it's that. And it's a change that's going to be around for forever. So you need to just go ahead and accept that you're going to be in a little bit of pain for the rest of your life. And that's just not true. More and more research is coming out every day that shows that not only do tissue damage and pain not correlate with each other all the time, but also that more often than not, images aren't really telling us why we're in pain and these degenerative changes that we're seeing that are being picked up aren't the reason that we're in pain. It's just a normal process of aging. All right, so I know statistics can get a little boring sometimes, but I wanted to run these numbers by you because I think they do a really good job of highlighting the points that I've made so far. I'll try to stay off my soapbox on a couple of these, but um, for the most part, I'm just going to take you through, again, some really good points that, that show in the science my points that I've been making throughout this. 
But again, I just want to go through some of the points that I've been making and show you the science behind them. So with neck pain, with neck pain among people with significant arthritic changes in their neck scans, only 10% have neck pain. And by arthritic changes, that's you people that are being told degenerative disc disease or de de degenerative joint disorder. It's all, it's all the same thing. It, it's not a disease. It's just a normal process of aging that everybody from ages 20 to 100 have. So everybody has a little bit of arthritis in their spine. And when the image picks that up, a lot of people are being told, hey, you have, you'd have degeneration, get used to pain. When in reality, you know, these studies are showing something like this one where only 10% of the people that showed up with those degenerative changes actually had pain. Um, another good point is in demolition derby drivers who crash 1500 times during their careers, which I think we can all agree is a lot, only 2% experience long lasting neck pain, which again does a really good job of highlighting the points that I've been making throughout this presentation. Okay, and shoulder pain by the numbers among people who have had successful surgery experience no pain and regain all movement, one in five still have a rotator cuff tear. So this takes you back to the tissue damage doesn't always correlate with pain. And then in people over the age of 30 who have a shoulder muscle tear, only one in three actually experience pain or limited activity. So again, tissue damage does not always equal immobility. It doesn't always equal pain. So low back pain is usually the popular one. Uh, among people with no back pain whatsoever, more than 40% have a bulging disc on their scan. And that number is low compared to a lot of the research that I've looked through. That More research depends on basically as your age goes up, more people present with more spinal changes. So just because a scan says you have a bulging disc, which is pushing on your spinal cord, that, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's why you're in pain. It could be contributing to it. But once again, doesn't necessarily mean that that's why you're in pain and bulging discs reabsorb over time. That's another thing that people aren't told for whatever reason is that once your disc, once your disc bulges, it's, it's just out for good. That's not the case. Discs are actually meant to be mobile. They're, they're meant to move around. And when one juts out like that, your body responds by stiffening and helping it reabsorb over time. And then another one in older patients, scans often show wrinkles on the inside, which again is this degenerative disc disease, changes arthritis, yet most people seeking help with back pain are middle-aged. And that holds water for me as well. Most of my patients are between 35 and 65 and not 65 and older, okay? So if all these arthritic changes, which increase in age were the reason that people are in pain, why am I not seeing more people that are older? It's not because they're just dealing with it. It's because the arthritis isn't the reason that all of these people are in pain. And then hip pain, which, which is often very much associated with back pain among people with no hip pain whatsoever, 75% of their scans still show tissue issues. And then in hockey players with no hip pain, once again, no hip pain whatsoever, two out of three have scans that show significant arthritis to their hips. So that's just, you know, expands upon the points that we're already making here. Different joints, same results. Knee pain, this is another one that a lot of people are experiencing. A lot of people are told not to lift certain amounts, not to run anymore. Among people with arthritis on their knee skin, only 50% experience pain. And I've seen large varieties in the clinic of people who have been told, yeah, I have a lot of arthritis, I have a lot of degeneration, I have bone spurs under my kneecap, I'm just not supposed to run anymore. And come, come to find out, that's not the real reason that they're in pain. And then another one, just to further explain that point, is among college basketball players with significant issues on their knee scans, one in three have no knee pain whatsoever. So the biggest takeaways I want you guys to take from this presentation is to consider your own beliefs about pain and how they can be contributing to their symptoms. Hopefully I've made it more than perfectly clear by this point that your thoughts about pain, what others are telling you about pain, your past experience with pain can all play into your stress level about your current situation, which can physically exacerbate the issue. So just by taking stock of what you think about your pain can help you get through this a lot better and can help decrease the daily pain that you're in. Second big takeaway is that pain's a good thing. You need it for protection, and that's why your body's doing it. 
your body is protecting you against something else. It's protecting you against further injury. So one of my favorite things is that I see a, a pill commercial that I'll leave unnamed, but it, it always says what pain. And that has people doing crazy stuff where, where they apparently were in pain, but now they can go jump off of waterfalls and they can do all of these things that they couldn't do before. And that's just masking the pain. That's just taking the pain sensors away. That's taking away that protective mechanism. And ultimately what they're not showing you probably is these people, you know, hobbling around on crutches a few days later because they just went and did something that their body wasn't prepared to do, but the signals weren't going to their brain saying, hey, this probably actually isn't okay. You shouldn't be doing this. And then the third big takeaway is pain does not always equal damage. And I think, I hope those stats have made it more than clear that just because something scary shows up on an image or just because you're being told that you have a diagnosis that means tissue damage or malalignment, that doesn't have to be why you're in pain. Sure, you can have some malalignments in your spine or your hips. Everybody does to a certain degree, but not everybody is walking around back and hip pain. And then here are the resources from this slideshow in case anybody is curious. The homework that I want you to do here is I want you to write down the answer to these next questions and bring them into your next appointment. And we'll talk about them when you get here. Okay, so the first one is, what have you been told is the cause of your pain? Then I want you to write down, what do you think the cause of your pain is? And you can, you can agree with the diagnosis that you've been given, that's okay. Or you can come up with your own theories, whatever you truly believe is your pain. What factors in your life can be contributing to your pain? So again, stress levels, sleep, eating habits, whatever you've got going on. And then what's one thing that you're going to do to improve these lifestyle factors? Alrighty. So thank you so much for taking the time to hang out with me here and learn a little bit more about pain. I promise you that it will help improve this experience as a whole. And I look forward to getting things started in the clinic. Alrighty. Take care.